came back, I dropped her off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know what the story is. Doc, you're after me. Good evening. Good evening. There we are. I'm on. I'm just not lit up yet. Thank you for coming. Uh, we got a great night. Uh, this is Double Decker. We're going to have uh, session one right now, or session three, thank you, and then uh, take our break in the fellowship hall, come back in here for session four, and uh, it's going to be good. I, I, many of you have already expressed how insightful this is and letting you kind of see the big picture of things that are really helping clear things up. So I'm just thrilled about that, and I'm glad Brother Paul and, and, and Mary come a long way from the north to come down here and, and share with us, so I'm, I'm glad they're here. Uh, remember the, uh, the love offering, the envelope, if you've not been able to help toward that, uh, do tonight, get it in one of the uh, um, offering plates that's by the door, and help us be able to take care of some of their needs, if you would, okay? All right, let's pray, and Doc, you come up. Lord, thank you for the night. Thank you for the opportunity to get back again and just enjoy your word. Lord, it's almost like feast, which these are, but it's like that for us to be able to sit down and just listen to all the things that you put together for us. Uh, thank you that you've created an appetite for you in this church, and you've brought people together that are excited to learn more. And so, Lord, open our eyes. Help us to understand. Give us a great night in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Paul, I got a song. <clears throat> this song's been on my mind uh, some of the day. I was thinking about the name of Jesus. There's something about that name. Just get our minds uh, brought in. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name Jesus 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 like a fragrance after the rain Jesus Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name Jesus 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 there's just something about that name Master Savior Jesus like a fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. Pastor. Gentlemen, while you're turning to Leviticus 23, I will be honest with you for the moment. I usually put a little something in my mouth to kind of moisten myself up. 
but it's usually gone before I stand to speak. The song service hasn't been lasting that long, and so I'm going to have to take it out of my mouth. Will you uh, forgive me for this and excuse me for a moment? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Man, I, I thought that thing never would dissolve, so... And I go the length of messages on the basis of how long it takes those to dissolve. And that one took an hour, so you, you're in for it. No, I'm just joking. Leviticus chapter 23. In fact, uh, since we're starting immediately into the study after a great special like that, we'll not stand together. We haven't been sitting that long, so let's just remain uh, seated. But let me begin reading uh, at verse 15 of Leviticus 23. Listen to what the scripture says. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. Now what day is that? Sunday after the Sabbath. So you shall count to you from Sunday after the Sabbath, uh, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven more Sabbaths complete. In other words, 49 days. Even after the morrow, after the seven, seven of that, those seven, that's 50 days, you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals, and they shall be of fine flour, and they shall both of the loaves be baked with leaven. Now that's a very significant point. But you'll notice that on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after uh, Resurrection Sunday, they would be taking two meal, uh, two loaves of bread, both of them baked with leaven and offer those two loaves uh, as a sacrifice to the Lord. Now, verse 21, And you shall proclaim on that same day that it will be a holy convocation, that means a Sabbath day, unto you. You shall do, do no servant work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all of your dwellings throughout your generations. And uh, I want you to notice in that verse, verse 21, it shall be a statute forever. Now sometimes when we read the word forever in the Bible, we get the idea it means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But the Hebrew language translated into English here uh, has a word which means forever, meaning the basis of your generation. In other words, when certain generations are finished. So even this verse says... Uh, it shall be forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And he's, of course, speaking to the nation of Israel. So there's going to come a time when that meal offering will, not, will be offered for a final time. Um, that's the passage that we're going to be looking at uh, this evening. Now, I want to add my greetings to you and uh, tell you how grateful I am that you've given uh, this time to me, and I trust that uh, we'll make it worth your while. We're going to uh, go at five, of course, and have a sack lunch together or a box lunch together, and then we'll come back in for a final time at six o'clock. And by the way, I watched, Mary and I watched this morning early, I mean about five o'clock actually, we watched the session that was done uh, last night. It was up on YouTube. And that, now, except for the teaching, teaching wasn't too swift, but the picture was wonderful. I mean, that is great equipment. Dave does a great job and his team in handling it. And I'm telling you that uh, it had the picture of me, the teacher, and the little video that I used right beside it all the way through. I listened to the whole thing. And uh, not that it was good, understand that. In fact, Mary woke me up twice during it because I <laughs> fell asleep in my own teaching. I'm just joking. But anyway, uh, you are fortunate to have that on YouTube 
and as a church to be able to go there. And by the way, there were a couple of dozen I noticed from other places who've already seen that and many from our folks will be watching it also. Now, our purpose in all of these studies, as you well know now, uh, is best described from Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And I want to read that verse in the NIV. Listen to what it says. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regards to a religious festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath day. For these are but shadows of the things that are to come. The reality is found in Jesus Christ alone. So Colossians, Paul the Apostle is declaring that all of the feast days, all of the new moons, all of the Sabbaths of the Old Testament, we would call them the Law of Moses. All of the Law of Moses is fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus. We'll know that and understand it, I think, a little better even after our study of this evening. So we come to the third of four studies, and we're going to look tonight at the power of Christ. Last night we saw the introduction, and we saw how all of the seven feast days, and by the way, not just the seven, they're the seven major feast days. There are many, many feast days and offerings and sacrifices that I'm not mentioning in these four days of study. Uh, they're the lesser known times of offerings in the Old Testament. But all of them, put them all together in one big ball of wax and you have it fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. One time after I was teaching along these lines, I had a fellow come up to me after a service and he said this. He said, oh, I see, Brother Paul, that you go along with replacement theology. And his meaning was, uh, you go along with the idea that the church has replaced Israel in the things of God, and so you don't believe in uh, the millennial reign and so on and so forth. He said, you believe in the replacement theology. Well, I corrected him. It's not that I believe in replacement theology. It's that I believe in fulfillment theology. So that all of the promises given in the old covenant are fulfilled in the new covenant, in the person of Jesus, and the new nation that he has established, the new Israel. It is sometimes called the church. It's sometimes called the body of Christ. But as Peter said in his letter, you are speaking to all believers who have come to faith in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And that word peculiar in the King James is the word pecuniary in the Greek language. It means high priced. So he says you're a royal priesthood. You are a, a holy nation. Now he's tying us with the new nation that the new covenant established fulfilled in the person of Christ. And he said you are a high priced people. Everybody in this room who knows Jesus can say amen to that fact, right? And so it's a fulfillment theology that I'm sharing with you in these days of Bible conference. Now, uh, this morning we saw the spring feasts of the nation of Israel. We're dealing with the seven major feasts. There are other feast days. There are other sacrifices. But we're dealing with the seven major sacrifices, seven major feast days, three in the spring, one in early summer, and three in the fall. And this morning we looked at the feast of Passover on the 14th day of Nisan. The lamb was slain and the flesh of the lamb was eaten 
in the original Passover. And the people ate unleavened bread with it. They had already swept the leaven. Yeast is another word for that. If you want to know what leaven is, it's think of it as yeast. It has been swept out. It has been removed. And the bread has been cooked without yeast, without leaven, unleavened bread. And they ate that meal. And that night they were delivered with their deliverer by the name of Moses. Now later in Leviticus, Moses has been commanded of the Lord to write this down. And he says, I'm giving you seven major feasts by which you're to remember how I delivered you, how I sacrificed for you, how I paid the price to get you free, and all of that kind of thing. It's in the Passover feast or lamb sacrifice. It's in the unleavened bread feast, which was the day after the Passover, Nisan the 15th, for seven full days. They did not eat anything with yeast. Un, uh, unleavened only. Now that was because while the death of the lamb portrayed uh, a redemption from sin, the unleavened bread portrayed a removal of sin. So there was nothing, uh, because once in a while in the New Testament, uh, the word leaven or yeast is used as a picture of sin. So that we're to live an unleavened life. That is a life where the Holy Spirit is leading us into righteous living instead of unrighteous living. And uh, that's what Paul is referring to when he talks about unleavened living. Now, uh, and so the unleavened bread was a seven day feast. But on the Sunday following the regular Sabbath day, the third feast was uh, the feast of the first fruits. After they went into the land, they started planting and harvesting. First thing they did was bring the sheaves of their first fruits to the priest in the tabernacle and then later in the temple when it was built under Solomon. And there they waved it to the Lord. And it was like they were saying, Hallelujah, Lord, look what you've given us, all of this. And it was a guarantee that the full harvest would eventually come. Now along comes the Lord Jesus. And he is the Passover lamb. He is the unleavened bread. When he said, I'm the bread of life, he was referring to unleavened bread. That is sinless bread. I'm the bread of life. He is the one who fulfilled the unleavened bread. And he is the first fruits resurrected to new life. Out of the seed comes genuine life. He's the first fruits. Those of us who trust him also experience all three of those. We died with him. We were buried with him. We were raised with him. We're seated today in heavenly places. And one of these days when he returns, even this old decrepit body that's still got the principle of sin in it, when we die, it'll be laid in the grave. Our spirit be with the Lord. But one day when he comes, we'll come with him. Those of us who have the pleasure of dying before he returns, we'll come with him, our bodies raised, we'll be united in a full glorified body. And that's the representation of those first three feasts. Now, we come to the fourth feast. It's 50 days after the feast of, Unle uh, of uh, first fruits. 49 Sabbaths plus the one day after. 50 days after. But when did it start? Now that's the first thing that we're going to look at tonight. It's called the Feast of the Pentecost. Um, and it's genuinely on the very first Pentecost, there was the birth of a brand new nation called Israel. You do know that Israel was a people in bondage. But they were not really formally a nation until that first Pentecost. And so what we see uh, is the original Pentecost. Here is on that first Pentecost, listen carefully, 1446 B.C., 1446 years before Christ, Israel 
left Egypt under the delivering power of Moses on Nisan the 14th, and 47 days later, they arrived at Mount Nebo. They arrived uh, at Mount Sinai. They arrived for the first Pentecost ever. Moses went up into the top of the mountain. He met with the Lord, and here's what the Lord said. The very first thing he said to him, take three days, get all the people ready, and then we're going to take care of some business. And for three days, Israel sanctified themselves. So 50 days after they were delivered out of Egypt on Nisan the 14th, we have the first experience of Pentecost. Now, uh, on that mountain, the scripture says there was fire and smoke. Let me read it to you. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended onto it in fire. And by the way, um, it'd be good for you to remember that our God always traveled in fire. Now, it wasn't the kind of fire that we think of when we cook fish or bacon and eggs on a riverbank sometime when we're fishing. It wasn't that kind of fire. It was the Shekinah glory. It was the outshining of his brilliance. And wherever God was, it was like it was a fiery reality. You remember Moses when God called him to deliver the children of Israel? He had been in the Midian desert taking care of his Jethro's sheep, his father-in-law's sheep. And the Lord appeared in the midst of what? A burning bush. And in Exodus chapter 3, listen to what it says. And the Lord spoke to Moses from in the midst of the burning bush. And the first thing he said to Moses was, take the shoes off your feet. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever God is, there is an outshining of glory that can only be described in the English language as fire. It's the Shekinah glory. And... Uh, God was all over that bush, and it was a sacred place. Moses was told to take the shoes off his feet because he was standing in the presence of the Lord. So what we have on Mount Sinai, 50 days after they came out of Egypt, is the Lord descended to the top of the mountain, and the people can only describe it as fire and smoke. It was the glory of God, the presence of the Lord. Now, uh, in Exodus chapter 32, we'll not turn, but let me just tell you, when you read Exodus 32, you'll find that for several days, Moses was in the mountain. In fact, he went up and down several times. Uh, one of the times uh, was he stayed so many days, the people got concerned and they kind of got backslidden and they built a golden calf. And Moses came down with the law written in the tablets of stone. And when he saw the golden calf, he got angry and he shattered the, 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 the stone. The Lord called him back up into the mountain, gave him new stones. And in the top of the mountain, Moses was given a new covenant for this new nation of Israel. Now, it was an old fashioned covenant this way. If you, then I. In other words, if you will keep the Sabbath, then I will bless your land. If you will do this and that and the other, then I will bless you with this and that and the other. That's the kind of covenant that God entered into with the nation of Israel on the first Pentecost, Mount Sinai, 50 days after they came out of Egypt. Now, um, but I want you to notice not only was that the original Pentecost. But there is a Pentecost prophetically, just like there was a Pentecost originally, I've just described it, there was a Pentecost prophetically. And just as Moses went up into the mountain to meet the Lord, in the new Pentecost, the prophetic Pentecost, that this is only a picture of, 
in Acts 2.1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Only it wasn't up in a mountain, it was up in an upper room. And that little embryonic church, 120 members, were all together in unity and in prayer in that upper room, and all at once, a new Pentecost is served. A new Pentecost is founded. We call it the day of Pentecost. But I remind you, there was the Pentecost originally on Mount Sinai. Then every year, they celebrated with the Feast of Pentecost, remembering how God spoke to them. But when Jesus died, 50 days after his resurrection, now the prophetic Pentecost has come to pass. The one that the original is ultimately to be fulfilled in. All right? Now, here is what happened. Uh, three things on this fulfillment of Pentecost. 50 days after Jesus was raised, that little church in the upper room, ready to meet the Lord, and they had no idea what they were in store for. Three things you need to know. First of all, the scripture says, they ate the bread. Now, on Pentecost, from the original on, they were to eat, listen to it, leavened bread. In other words, the bread eaten at the Feast of First Fruits 50 days before was unleavened bread. The bread eaten all through the seven feast days of that unleavened feast was unleavened bread. Now, 50 days later, they're to make two loaves of leavened bread. Now, the Jewish people for the centuries previous to this had no idea what that meant. They had no idea what was intended with this. Now, on the fulfillment of prophetically of the first Pentecost to the last Pentecost that is for us 50 days after Jesus was raised they cooked two loaves and remember in the new covenant in the new testament seed is often referred to as people you remember when Jesus gave the parable and he said uh, the, the word of God is the seed in one of the parables but then in another one of those parables he said and the seed are the people of the kingdom. So seed is sometimes associated with people. Now when they made those two loaves on the prophetic Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus was raised from the dead, they made it with the seed that represented two loaves. Not one loaf, all the others that had been one loaf. This is two loaves with Leaven. Now, why in the world are there two loaves with leaven? Well, uh, because the Bible uses the word leaven to represent sin. And that's what it represents in this Pentecost loaf. In other words, whatever those two loaves were, they were seen to be a partaker of sinfulness. Now, listen to what is happening here. What happens is you have a picture of the Jews who were believing. Remember after, after Jesus was raised from the dead, the church was scared to death, but they'd come together to pray. And they were in for a real show on this new Pentecost. But here's one loaf that represents believing Jews. Then you have the other loaf which represents believing Gentiles. And what you have on the fulfillment of the, of the Feast of Pentecost is two loaves still with sin present, believing Jews, believing Gentiles, come together in one sacrifice. In other words, we are one people presenting ourselves to the Lord, pictured in those two loaves of leavened bread. Ladies and gentlemen, from the, from the day we were born, even through the day we were born again, 
to the day we will die if Jesus tarries until our death. We are new in nature. We are new in creation by the power of God. But we still have sin present in us. John said in one of his epistles, if any man says he has no sin, he's a liar and the truth isn't in him. So even believers in our day will be troubled with the principle of sin that abides in our flesh, that is in our body. But as a new person in Christ, when we die, we go into the presence of the Lord and that body, empowered by sin, is laid to rest. And one of these days, Jesus will let the trumpet be sounded. We'll see that later on tonight. And the dead in Christ, the body of every dead believer, will be raised incorruptible and sin will be gone. But Pentecost is a picture of how sinners, Jew and Gentile, Jewish Gentile sinners become believers together and are one body offered to God the Father, all because of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have then is not only Pentecost originally and Pentecost prophetically. And by the way, do you remember how they were in that upper room? All at once there was the sound of the rushing mighty wind and tongues of what? Fire sat on their heads. Well, what a picture of the original Pentecost. And what we have in this portrayal of Christ in the upper room. Let me get you in the upper room there. There we are. The glory of the Lord. It's like fire. People heard it from all around. Didn't know what was happening. And they came and they began to speak in every language imaginable because the city of Jerusalem was filled with people who were there for the feast day of Pentecost. And they began to teach and speak in languages they didn't even know. And every man heard in their language. Well, what is it? Are these people drunk? Well, you could call it that. You could call it that. They're, they were drunk on the spirit. Now, they weren't drunk with spirits. But they were drunk on the Spirit. And there was the sound of the rushing mighty wind. And tongues of fire sat on their head. When I taught you the tabernacle, I asked you this question. Where did those tongues of fire go? You know the answer to that. Paul said it in his Corinthian letter. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And you are not your own. You're bought with a price. In other words, that group of people in that upper room, saved Jews and saved Gentiles, leavened bread, if you will, came together, two loaves in one offering, and the Holy Spirit descended and came to dwell in the body of every believer on that terrific day of Pentecost 50 days after Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, what does this mean for us personally? What happened on that day, 50 days after Jesus was raised, that makes it personal for us? Well, on Pentecost, you have the birthday of the church. In other words, this called out assembly... Ecclesia, that's what the word means, called out assembly. These Jews and Gentiles who've answered the call of, we, shall, we say the gospel, the message of Christ, they have been called out and the church was birthed. And on that day, Peter stood up to preach and gave a little Southern Baptist invitation and 3,000 people came to faith in Christ. And the church began to explode immediately. Now, let me remind you that when you study the scriptures together, you'll see that that church on the day of Pentecost, having its birth there, is the same as the holy nation that Jesus founded that's called the new Israel in the new covenant. And is the presence of his kingdom with him ruling in our hearts in this world 
today. So the kingdom of God is already here. Jesus said when he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he said, the gospel of the kingdom is among you. I am here. And when you trust me, you become the one in whom the kingdom is real. And that's what happens when you become a believer. And since Pentecost, a new uh, birthday is celebrated. And that is the new uh, church in which the Lord Jesus lives. In other words, this is a brand new house in which he lives. You remember how they built the tabernacle. And on that day when they first went into the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord filled it. That's the presence of the Lord. And then once a day on the year, Day of Atonement, the, the high priest would take the blood and the glory would show up in the Holy of Holies, the presence of the Lord. But that was just one day a year. And then under Solomon, they built the temple. And the same thing on the Day of Atonement. The high priest would take the blood of that goat, would sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and the glory of the Lord would descend and fill the temple. And God was dwelling in that temple one day a year. In the tabernacle, one day a year in the temple. But now watch. Since Pentecost, Herod's temple was still standing, but the glory was never there. In that little upper room, 120 people became themselves the temple of God. And the Lord Jesus dwelt in them in the person of the Holy Spirit. And every conversion since has become that miracle. You experience being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ and your body became his temple. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, Paul the Apostle said to those Corinthians, there is a way in which, a sense in which, when you come together, you are a spiritual temple. It's in the plural. It's, in the plural. it's not singular. It is true that our body, singular, every person's body is the temple but there's a sense in which when the body comes together when people come together there is a spiritual temple there in other words we've gathered on Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. in uh, Montgomery Texas and do you know that this place right now in a unique fashion in the biblical sense is the temple of the living God God's presence is here and that happens wherever the body of Christ gathers. Now, wherever a Christian goes, there goes the Spirit living in the temple. Our body is His. And Hebrews says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you'll never not be His spiritual temple. Your body will always be His temple until He takes you out into His presence and the old body's laid to rest in the grave. But the point is this, when we come together, there is a spiritual sense in which it's a spiritual temple, the presence of the Lord. That happened on that first Pentecost. And old Peter, full of the Spirit, stood up and began to preach Everybody thought they were drunk with wine. He gave an invitation and 3,000 people were converted. It was Pentecost. It was what the old Pentecost, the original Pentecost, pointed to. And what we experienced at it was the birthday of the church. Now, not only is it a new house in which he lives, it came about because of that first, that prophetic Pentecost. 50 days after Jesus was raised. But there was also a new law by which he guides. Now follow me carefully here. The Lord Jesus, remember, is our new Moses. Moses gave the law to Israel in the Old Covenant. You remember what the Old Covenant was? If you, then I. If you, then I. But do you know what the rule of the New Covenant is? I have, therefore you may. In other words, we're to love one another. 
In the old covenant, it was love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That was the law of Moses. That's a good law. But in the new covenant, here's the new law of love. You will love one another as I have already loved you. So that my love for you, my love for a wife, my love for my children is not to reflect an old covenant value, but a new covenant value. I'm to love as I know he loves me. How does he love me? Oh my goodness. Sacrificially. Unconditionally. How am I to love? sacrificially, unconditionally, servitude, serving with a heart filled with love. That's what Jesus did. And that's the new covenant of the law. Did you know the Ten Commandments are not restated in the new covenant? Now they are in the new covenant. They're talked about in different ways. Nine of them are. Do you know which one is not in the new covenant? Restated, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Did you know that's not the law of the new covenant? You know why? Now listen carefully. Because according to Paul the Apostle, every day is a Sabbath day, a day of rest for all of those of us who are in Christ Jesus. He said, I believe he wrote Hebrew, he said it in the book of Hebrews. We are in an eternal Sabbath in other words, you rest every day from labor as far as eternity is concerned. You can't do anything for your redemption. You can't do anything about your sin. In Christ, we are resting in an eternal Sabbath. So we can choose a day, which the early church chose the first day of the week, the day that he rose from the dead, to honor coming together. But it's not a command. You will never find a command to make a day a Sabbath day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't understand this many years ago when I was a young pastor raising children. I used to not let them go out to eat on Sunday. I used to uh, fill up on Saturday so I wouldn't have to fill up on Sunday because Sunday was a Sabbath. Now, I knew that Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath, but I thought Sunday was the Christian Sabbath. Listen, Saturday is the Sabbath day in the Old Covenant. Sunday was never declared to be a Sabbath day. Sunday is a day of celebration of the living Lord that we have decided to recognize as the church. But let me tell you what the Sabbath day is. It's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We rest in Christ every day. So if we choose to gather on a Sunday afternoon, hallelujah, we're free to do it in honor of the Lord Jesus. If we decide to gather on a Tuesday night for a revival meeting, hallelujah, we're free to do it. But there's no command that we have to. It's not that we have to, it's that we get to. We want to. And sometimes we come together and there is a uniqueness of that temple being together and it's a wonderful experience. But you are always the temple of God wherever you go, whether it's to school, to work, to play, to a football game, to see uh, the Astros lose the World Series again, you know, whatever it is, you are the presence of the temple of God in that place, in that moment. Is that ringing for you? Are you understanding what I'm saying here? So there is a new house in which he lives. That's his spiritual temple, each of us individually, all of us collectively. There is a new law with which he guides. It's the law of love. Love the Lord your God. Love one another as you have been loved. And by the way, that's true for everything else he commands you. Forgive one another. How? As you have been forgiven. Accept one another. How? As you've been accepted. Do you understand? In the new covenant, the new law is the law of love. I have already, Jesus said, done it all. Look at the seven feast days. I've accomplished them all. Therefore, as I am to you, you are to be to other people. We represent the living Lord Jesus in love, 
and forgiveness and acceptance and so on. Is that not marvelous? So we never do something in order to get God to like us. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't ever do anything to get God to like you. Why? Because he likes you based on how Jesus did it. And how did he do it? Oh, he did it wonderfully well. He did it completely. It's finished. He said that on the cross. It is a done deal. And so we don't do what we do in order to get God to like us or to love us. You don't even do what you do in order to get God to forgive you. Why? He's forgiven you on the basis of what Jesus did. Then what do we do? We confess our sin because we're ashamed of it. Uh, it drives us willy-nilly. And we know the Spirit of God's grieved. But we don't do it in order to get Him to love us more. We do it because we're already forgiven. Because we're already loved. Because we're already accepted. I told you this when I taught you the tabernacle. If God has a refrigerator in heaven today, your picture's on the front door, believer. And every time he looks at you, do you know what he says? I love them. I love him. I love her. I accept him. I accept her. I forgive him. I forgive her. How can he do that? All because of who and what Jesus did. So we live in a new law that guides us. It's the law of love, right? Now there's one final thing I want to say and we'll be finished. Not only is the new house in which he uh, lives, the birthday of the church, and his law, by the way, is written on the tablet of our heart. That's where the new law is. But there is a Holy Spirit of Pentecost that empowers us. So there's a new house in which he lived. There's a new law by which he guides us. And there is a new power by which he moves us. In other words, we have a power that we didn't know we had. And do you know what that power is? It is the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that when the Holy Spirit comes into a believer, that's me, that's you, that's us. He does at least three things. Three major things. First, he comes to infill us. Now, when we're filled with the Spirit, it doesn't mean we get more of the Holy Spirit. Don't think of a jug where water's poured into it and you get more water. You got all the Holy Spirit you'll ever get the moment of conversion because he's a person. He came to dwell in you. The issue of being filled with the Spirit is the Spirit getting more control of you. The Spirit getting more control of me. You know what a person is when they're uh, controlled by joy? It means in a situation where sadness would normally control them, they're controlled by joy. Do you know what it is to be filled with the Spirit in a moment when selfishness or self would normally control us? We're under the control of the Holy Spirit. He infills us. He, he does this so we have His presence on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. He comes in to fill us with a brand new power. Now, the second thing He does, He does come to empower us. He's gifted us. He's given us certain gifts. I have certain gifts. You have certain gifts. I think I know some of them. I may not know all of them yet. You may have discovered some of your gifts. Do you know those gifts are to be done for the benefit of other people because the Holy Spirit empowers you to do it? Do you know when a person says, I cannot love that person? You know what they're actually saying? They're actually saying, I will not love that person. It's an obstinate refusal rather than a trusting of the Holy Spirit. Because listen, when the scripture says love that person as you've been loved, you might be able to say or have to say as I have to say sometimes, I've got something I know right now. I, don't, I, I just don't know whether I can love them or not. I just don't know. But I do know he can. I do know he does. Therefore, here's what I have to do. I choose to move toward that person in love, doing the things that express love. And the Holy Spirit 
empowers me. He releases the power needed to actually be toward that person a way that you cannot be left to yourself. So he infills us and he indwells us and he enlightens us. You remember Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless because when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit will come, the Comforter will come, and He will guide you into all understanding. Now, will He ever give you all the understanding uh, that you'll ever get? No. It's a lifetime. I had never studied the feast days until one year ago, last August. I started studying them in order to present them for the first time. I had never seen much of what I've shared with you as seen in the feast day. The Holy Spirit kept turning on lights. Have you ever been there hearing somebody, your pastor preach, or hearing somebody else teach, or have you ever just been reading your Bible, and all at once it was like a light bulb comes on? And you see something. You understand something that you've never seen before. I had a lady after the service this morning say, Brother Paul, it's, I just I see things I've never seen before. Well, I know what that person, because just a year ago I was experiencing that. And i got to remind you, I'm 80 years old. Some of you are not near that. I'm 80 years old. I've pastored for 40 years. I've been traveling the last 20 in Bible conference. That makes 60 years in ministry. And I had never seen these things about the feast days. That's absolutely right. I'd never seen them. Do you know why? Because the Holy Spirit gives enlightening. And He will enlighten us about the truth until the day we die. That's His ministry. He indwells us. He lives in us. He infills us, He empowers us, and He enlightens us. And it's all because you and I have experienced our Pentecost. You know when that was? The moment you trusted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you got in on everything they got in on that first Pentecost after Jesus was raised from the dead. Oh, not in the literal sense in the upper room and the, the tongues of fire. No, in the real way, the person of the Holy Spirit came to live in us, to be himself in us, and to create the very life of Christ in us so that we in the new covenant now will be people who choose to love, choose to forgive, choose to accept, Choose to move toward one another. All because it's what God has done toward us. And we become His ambassadors to the human race. Does this make sense? Now I'm only going to deal with one feast this first hour. That's the Feast of Pentecost. Some of you are thinking perhaps, oh good, I thought He had another one or two that was coming. That was going to make for a long session. No, we're going to end now, and we're going to go get a bite of lunch. And after uh, our sack lunch, we're going to come back in here, and the Lord willing, the creek don't arrive, we're going to look at the, fall, the three fall feast days. And when we're finished, we'll understand Jesus is our Passover, our unleavened bread, our first fruits, our Pentecost, our Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. It's all in the person of the Lord Jesus. It's not replacement theology. It is fulfillment theology. Amen? All right. Then why don't you stand up for just a moment? You've been sitting and I've been waving my arms and being free here. So uh, let's just raise our hands together. Say hallelujah. Let's go eat, all right? God bless you. You're all dismissed.